Thank you very much, Brian, and thank you all very much. Um, I was enjoying myself so much this morning that I'd almost forgotten I was due to speak. Uh, so let's hope I haven't forgotten what I'm going to say. Uh, but it occurred to me during the morning talks uh, that in various ways, brilliantly expressed, we've been exploring the material world of Admiral Lord Nelson, the world he was very familiar with. He also knew many of the, the, the figures and historical characters that we've encountered, notably Sir William Hamilton, uh, Ferdinand IV of Naples, uh, Leopold of Tuscany. He sat for two portraits to Henrik uh, Fugger. And with some of these individuals, of course, he slept with their wives. So uh, we're very much in comfortable territory here, uh, although we're not discussing porcelain. I'm also very aware that uh, I haven't forgotten that we've got lunch, so don't worry. At 1.57 on Monday, the 11th of June, 1951, the alarm bells went off in Gallery 10 at the new National Maritime Museum in Greenwich. When the lights were turned up, the wardens revealed this distressing sight of a cabinet which had been smashed and broken into during the evening in the Nelson Gallery, Nel Gallery 10. Only one item had been taken from the showcase, which was otherwise filled with objects, relics, weapons, uh, belonging to Admiral Nelson. This lovely photograph was, this fascinating photograph was published in the press the next day. Uh, the theft caused an enormous scandal, questions in the Houses of Parliament, questions from the, 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 the King. Uh, this, this photograph I love because it looks like it wasn't me, Gov, you know. Um, <laughs> I was nowhere, I wasn't near it. The jewel that had been taken looked like this. This is the last photograph of the object that had been taken, known as Admiral Nelson's Schelenk. It had been purchased for the Maritime Museum by public appeal in 1936 uh, with the intervention of the relatively new National Art Collections Fund. The jewel itself had belonged to Nelson's family until 1895 when it was sold appropriately upstairs or along this, the corridor at Christie's in this building for 700 pounds, uh, approximately maybe 75, 25,000, 75,000 today. And then when it was sold, bought by the National Maritime Museum in 1936, it was paid 1,500 pounds, maybe 100,000 uh, pounds. It was the treasure, is uh, true to say, of the new museum's collection, which was founded to promote the study of Britain's naval and maritime past. This extraordinary object had belonged to Admiral Nelson. Nelson, of course, today is one of our uh, greatest naval figures in this country. In 1798, however, he was a relatively still unknown naval com commodore, uh, soon to be admiral. Uh, he'd achieved some eye-catching exploits already in single ship actions, uh, and his exploits at the Battle of Cape St. Vincent against the Spanish in 1797 had captured the public imagination. But at the outset of 1798, he was about to embark on the seven years uh, during which he would build his tremendous fame and celebrity, and to a certain degree, notoriety, uh, leading to his death at the moment of his greatest victory at the Battle of Trafalgar in October 1805. In the spring of 1798, Nelson was tasked by the British government to take a squadron of warships into the eastern Mediterranean to hunt down a vast armada of French warships and transports, some 200 in all, which had recently left Toulon. At that stage, no one in Britain intelligence knew where this vast and dangerous armada was heading. It was even feared that it might have been heading for this country. Nelson headed down the Mediterranean, but lacking intelligence, uh, missed the transports and missed this vast armada. He was, however, too late, therefore, to delay the invasion of Egypt by the French in July 1798. The French army under command of the up and rising General Bonaparte. The French 
uh, had wanted to invade Egypt for various reasons. Uh, Bonaparte had complex reasons himself for invading it, including uh, a desire to build, if you like, uh, an enlightened republic in Egypt. Um, but also, strategically, Egypt was the gateway to British interests in India, uh, and so was a vital strategic uh, post for the British, uh, which they wanted uh, to secure back. At that time, Egypt uh, was within the realm of the Ottoman Empire, this vast ramshackle, sprawling domain that ran really from the borders of Hungary all the way around the eastern Mediterranean to Libya, or latter-day Libya, a vast, sprawling territory, uh, normally under control of the monarch or sultan of Turkey, based at Constantinople, but in practice in the hands of warring tribal factions uh, and am very ambitious pashas who ruled in the sultan's name, but often really were pursuing their own aims. Indeed, when Bonaparte invaded Egypt in July of 1798, he really thought he was doing the Sultan of Turkey a bit of a favor, as the Mamluks in uh, Egypt, who were the ruling tribe of that territory, had caused the Turks endless difficulty in recent years, and indeed there have been expeditions from Turkey to Egypt within the last decade to seek to quell their, their ambition. However, on this, as for many reasons, Bonaparte misjudged the man he was dealing with. The Sultan in 1798 was Sultan Selim III. He was born in 1764, uh, the son of Sultan Mustafa III, uh, who succeeded, however, he succeeded his uncle, Abdul Hamid, in 1789. He was the first European ruler to hear of the violation of his own territory, being the nearest at hand across the Mediterranean in Turkey. He was uh, a very cultivated young man uh, with a keen interest in culture, the arts. He wrote poetry, he wrote music. Uh, and although he lived a very secluded, hidden life uh, in his palace in Constantinople, he was very well informed very connected to European arts, uh, and corresponded with many leading uh, politicians, artists, and cultural figures throughout Europe. He was, however, like the rest of the Turkish court at that time, predominantly a Francophile. The French had been dominant in Turkey for, for more than a century culturally, and many of the uh, ministers in the Sultan's divan, his inner circle of advisors, were very strongly drawn to the French and to French ideals, uh, up to and including the French ideals surrounding the revolution. So at first, when he heard the news of, uh, his invasion, of the invasion of his territory, he didn't know quite what to do and was uncertain how to react, and whether to uh, welcome the French invasion or to defend it, defend against it. In August, on August the 1st, just a few weeks after the invasion, Nelson literally stumbled across the French fleet anchored off Alexandria, off the coast of Egypt, having, uh, embark having disembarked the French army into that country. He encountered 13 French warships in a position of safety. They'd anchored, of course, inshore, in an ark, in what they thought was a safe position. Nelson, however, without hesitation, led his own squadron of 11 British warships into the bay in the failing light of the uh, evening to attack immediately. The wind was in his favor, and uh, one of Nelson's greatest strategic strengths was that he was never hesitant to take action when needed. There then ensued over the following 48 hours uh, the brutal, devastating, and violent Battle of the Nile, as it came to be called, uh, during which Nelson succeeded in utterly destroying the French fleet anchored off Egypt, thereby cutting off Bonaparte's supply route and also any means of immediate escape from Egypt. So the French army was now uh, locked in Egypt, 
uh, with no means of returning to France, having to rely upon themselves and with no uh, possibility of reinforcement. This changed the geopolitical state so much that the Sultan immediately uh, lent uh, his full support to the British uh, effort, uh, realizing that this was the way to go. Uh, and he immediately desired to recognize Nelson's feet in defending his, his own territory in Egypt with a gift. Gift giving in Turkish royal cul culture was very long established. Uh, this uh, painting, which was sold at Christie's last year, shows a previous and earlier sultan in the 1750s receiving a delegation of French uh, diplomats in the Topkapi Palace in the audience chamber. Uh, the sultan then, and in Selim's day, would, be receive, would receive his visitors perched on a low sofa bed, generally displaying uh, his weapon of honor, as you can see alongside the sultan, uh, together in a niche uh, set into the wall, uh, turban jewels, uh, basically, of course, coronets or crowns in Western culture that were there to display his status, his rank, and, of course, his wealth. For Nelson, uh, the sultan decided to send 2,000 sequins, or gold coins, to the British uh, fleet in Egypt to reward them for distribution amongst the men who'd been wounded in the action. But for Nelson himself, he chose to send Nelson a fine fur, in his words, and a superior shelenk. Now, a fine fur was well understood in Western terms. This French ambassador here is wearing a, a, a robe that he's been recently invested with by the Sultan, a rich uh, fur-lined pelisse, as it was known, came to be known, which was a robe of honor uh, in Turkish culture. The shalenk, however, was a more mysterious uh, term for a jewel or object that was not familiar in England. Indeed, the first definition was only published in 1856, uh, when it was described as a kind of ornament worn on the headdress in an English-Turkish dictionary. The French, however, because of their closer ties to Turkish culture, came closest to how the Turks them saw, themselves saw such an object. They described it as a bird's feather, which one would attach to your headdress or turban as a sign of valor. And indeed, that is exactly what the Sultan intended to give to Nelson. Indeed, shalenks were very widespread in Turkish military culture, but were predominantly of a very simple form. This uh, Turkish Greek officer is wearing in his turban uh, a very, very simple shalenk. Uh, this is, as far as I, this is the only image I found of such a simple object worn as it was intended to be. Uh, and as you can see, it's quite simply a piece of silver metal cut out with five rays or five prongs uh, in a simple feather format. Uh, and we know from accounts that the Turkish treasury um, supplied to the Sultan's commanders in the field thousands of similar cut metal uh, objects which commanders in the battlefield would distribute to men and officers during an action for individual feats of bravery or gallantry. The British consul in Constantinople at that time was a very young man called John Spencer Smith, just 28 years old. Britain had no ambassador in Turkey at that time, the ties with Constantinople being so weak uh, at the moment that the crisis emerged in Egypt. Spencer Smith, in fact, was acting uh, in the absence of the ambassador, uh, who was very, a uh, replacement having been very slowly appointed in London. Uh, the new ambassador would be Lord Elgin, uh, who, of course, we're all very familiar with, uh, who exploited his position in Constantinople to uh, strip the Parthenon, of course. Um, but Spencer Smith, uh, was acting there and suddenly thrown into a crisis of um, global importance. He was summoned 
to the palace uh, after the Sultan's decision to award Nelson a shalenk uh, to see the jewel before it was uh, sent to Nelson for presentation. He returned after the meeting at the palace in September 1798, just a few weeks after the Battle of the Nile, uh, and scrawled a very hasty letter to the foreign, foreign Office in London on which he sketched what he had seen. Uh, this letter still survives at the National Archives in Kew, and this is the drawing that Spencer Smith scrawled in the British Embassy at Pera, having just seen the object. And in his letter, he describes to the British um, Foreign Office that Nelson was to receive a superb egret, an egret being a, a familiar term uh, to the British, meaning a head, head ornament of a feather kind, called a shalenk, or plume of triumph, rich of its kind, being a blaze of brilliance, crowned with a vibrating plumage and a radiant star in the middle, turning upon its center by means of watchwork. And Spencer Smith further described this object as the first, as comparable to the first order of chivalry in Christendom. Uh, that's important because to British eyes, this strange Islamic object needed to fit into uh, a British sense of what these orders of chivalry meant. Uh, the British were already developing various classes of orders uh, for acts of valor or chivalry in the battlefield. The Turks didn't see this object in those ways. So Spencer Smith here is almost immediately trying to define it in terms that the Foreign Office uh, would understand. Uh, Spencer Smith valued the jewel himself uh, at approximately £1,000 sterling, which might be about £100,000 today. He further commented that no similar jewel had ever been awarded by the Sultan to a non-Muslim uh, recipient. So it was already very extraordinary in many ways and a unique gift. The Sultan charged one of his uh, clerks in the divan to sail to Egypt with this object to present to Nelson. And he selected a, one of his elderly clerks called Kelim Effendi, Effendi being a minister. He sailed from Constantinople on the 18th of September. And this, although this is not uh, Kelim, uh, this portrait uh, shows uh, Mehmet Said Effendi, the ambassador to Paris in the 1740s by George Engelhardt Schroeder, but it shows very much of the sort of uh, delegation that the, was sent by the Sultan to find Nelson in the Eastern Mediterranean. This is very much the, the, the number of people, some 11 or 12 attendants were with the minister as he left Constantinople. And we know uh, that when he arrived off the coast of Egypt eventually in a Turkish warship, they were all suffering severe seasickness. Uh, Nelson had already left Egypt for Naples so they missed him, uh, and they had to be taken in, into the care of one of the other captains, uh, British captains, who was patrolling the Egyptian coast to recover their health before they could continue their journey. However, news of the award did reach London uh, before <laughs> they reached Nelson. News of the Battle of the Nile, together with this uh, letter from Spencer Smith, <clears throat> with the description of these various presents, uh, was received in London in early October 1798. And as you can see from this fantastic drawing by James Gilray, uh, it was immediately lampooned. These awards that this foreign potentate had loaded on Nelson for his victory. Uh, this famous image, uh, titled The Hero of the Nile, depicts Nelson weighed but bowing beneath the weight of his fur pelisse. Uh, displaying the captured sword of the French admiral at the battle and wearing what Gilray imagines is the kind of object that the Sultan had presented to him, this exotic jewel, uh, turban jewel type object. It already shows as well that people in London were to a certain degree uh, cynical of Nelson's uh, great attachment to fame, which he uh, later exploited. Spencer Smith's drawing reached the Foreign Office and was leaked and soon reached the Fashion Press uh, where it was published in January 1799 with this tidier version of the sketch that he had scrawled. 
Uh, and of course, inevitably, it sparked a fashion craze uh, in London for similar jewels, uh, both amongst men and women, um, to be worn not only in terms of being uh, a la mode, but also to demonstrate their loyalty to the British war effort, which was then at a critical uh, phase. But still, there was mystification, if you like, of what this object was and what it meant. Still, uh, it was reproduced uh, endlessly. Uh, Nelson was awarded uh, a 500 pound gift from Lloyd's of London, the insurance um, people, an insurance coffee house, uh, to purchase himself a collection of silver to commemorate his victory at the Nile. Nelson had adopted, even though he was still over in Naples, had adopted the Shalenk as his new heraldic crest. And for this service of dishes and plates, uh, the silversmith charged with the task, Paul Storr, uh, used the drawing of the Shalenk as published in the press uh, as the finials or handles for these dish covers as you can see. And the College of Arms similarly reproduced it uh, on the dishes and on the silver work as one of Nelson's heraldic crests, uh, showing here on the left, of course, uh, surmounted by the baron's coronet, representing the barony that he had been awarded uh, after the battle by King George III. Nelson's banker, Alexander Davison, wished to uh, send his own reward to Nelson. This is my porcelain slide. Um, <laughs> the only one. Uh, but anyway, uh, he wanted to award Nelson himself, uh, principally because Nelson had sent instruction that Davison should act as the prize agent for the Battle of the Nile, which is an incredibly valuable job to be given uh, because the prize agent earned 5% on every deal. Uh, and in, indeed, Davison would earn more money from the Battle of the Nile than, than Nelson did. Um, prize agent was charged with selling to the British Admiralty the captured ships that Nelson had taken at the battle. So to, by way of thanks and to, by way of friendship, uh, Davison commissioned Dar the Derby Porcelain Factory, uh, whose uh, uh, retail premises were in Bedford Street alongside Davison's offices in, in Covent Garden, uh, to produce this wonderful uh, armorial porcelain service. Uh, and this is from a pair of wine coolers. And you can see on the, um, on the plaque, uh, the Shalenk crest, and note the blue disc in the center of the, of the Shalenk jewel. Now, in one of the wonderful serendipitous uh, moments of researching uh, this story for a book I wrote last year, uh, during which this drawing emerged in a collection in Canada. This drawing came to Nelson with the original jewel uh, and is a drawing completed in Turkey as part of the presentation to Nelson, showing clearly the jewel that was given to Nelson uh, with all its diamonds individually identified and with this blue disc and the star rotating in the center. It's in very poor, it's recently been uh, conserved, so it looks much better now. Uh, and on the bottom, you will see it's been annotated. Now, the annotation is by Captain Josiah Nisbet. Nisbet was Nelson's stepson, uh, the son of Nelson's wife by her first marriage. Um, and he was serving in Nelson's fleet in the Mediterranean and had been present when the jewel was eventually presented to Nelson in Naples in December 1798. So he had been right there. And on this drawing, uh, Nisbet has scrawled that this is a drawing of the Chilink, which was given to his galley. He presents it to uh, Mr. Stanley, who was the uh, British uh, consul in uh, Livorno. He describes it as a drawing of the Chilink, which was given to his gallant father, Lord Nelson of the Nile, by the Grand Seigneur, the soubriquet by which the Sultan was known in the West, and dates it 1798. So this I clearly identifies this jewel with the presentation to Nelson by the Turkish Sultan. However, already it seems that everything was changing. Nelson, soon after the presentation of the jewel, had to evacuate the Neapolitan royal family, uh, Ferdinand IV, Mary Carolina, and their children, uh, to Sicily when the French 
invaded Naples uh, and a revolution took place uh, which expelled the royal family. So in exile, Nelson lingered in exile for several months with the Neapolitan royal family, during which this portrait was painted by the little-known court painter Leonardo Gazzardi. Uh, this portrait was one of several completed by Gazzardi of Nelson at that time, uh, and indeed this particular example is currently on display at Masterpiece. Um, you'll notice that Nelson is displaying um, a severe scar on his forehead, which is part of a wound that he received during the battle when a lump of iron hit him at high speed. Uh, he's already wearing many of the decorations that had been awarded uh, following the battle, including gold medals from the King of England. But he's also showing the jewel, wearing it as he intended to, like a turban jewel, on his headwear, on his naval hat. And he had to seek permission of the king to do that. However, you can see that the jewel is already quite different from the jewel that we saw on that drawing. So what is going on? Well, in a, in a hint to what has happened, in a letter that Nelson sent back to his wife, Fanny Nelson, in England, he commented, having copied Spencer Smith's drawing, having forwarded Spencer Smith's drawing, Nelson himself said that the top should have 13 fingers or sprigs in allusion to the 13 ships taken. And what has happened is that Although the Sultan had sent this Jelenk to Nelson, the Sultan himself was already thinking of commissioning from the goldsmiths in Constantinople a bespoke jewel for Nelson, a more flamboyant object for Nelson, above and beyond uh, the normal Jelenk that he and the Turkish culture were familiar with. And in the British College of Arms, only 18 months ago, we found a drawing of that jewel which is here. Uh, this is a drawing that was completed for Nelson by the College of Arms when Nelson sought to change his crest that we'd already seen to represent the new jewel that he received during 1799 from Constantinople, uh, made especially for him as a bespoke object. And as you can see, it does display the 13 rays or prongs representing the 13 French ships captured at the battle. It has a similar rotating star, but this time on a red, Ottoman red uh, background plaque. Uh, it has a wreath of uh, enameled flowers set in the center with rose diamonds uh, and terminating in a tied bow. Um, and indeed, shalenk in modern day Turkish indeed means a wreath. So it's very much a sort of wreath of honor and so the Sultan clearly, with all his artistic and aesthetic uh, sentiment, had been personally involved in arranging for this jewel to be made and sent to Nelson by way of follow-up to the first jewel. Now that first jewel, that jewel, uh, is now lost. And it is believed that it was broken up in 1799 and probably reset by Nelson for various other jewels for Emma Hamilton. This jewel returned with Nelson uh, to London in 1800, and indeed he was painted with it by William Beachy in November 1800, soon after his return to London. And you can see the jewel sitting on his hat uh, behind him. Indeed, it's perched on the per Turkish police that had also been given. And this very closely matches this recently uh, discovered drawing at the College of Arms, this much larger, more flamboyant object. And Beachy himself um, was a stickler for detail, so he would have made sure that he got as much detail as he could uh, into the image of the jewel. And indeed, when Nelson himself uh, returned to England, he had his coat of arms changed to represent this new, more flamboyant jewel with now a red center. If you recall the Derby porcelain with the blue center, it now has this red center uh, and with the wreath and perched on top of a naval coronet. Nelson had, there it is. Nelson had a version made in silver wire. This is an original Nelson hat uh, on display at Westminster Abbey, uh, which he would wear with his undress uniform when he wasn't wearing all his orders and decorations and he had a, a sort of soft version made. Uh, and this is very likely the kind of object that he wore in his hat at the Battle of Trafalgar. 
You'll also notice he's got a bespoke green shade on his naval hat. Uh, of course, famously, he lost the sight in one eye uh, and always suffered from poor eyesight at sea, so the shade would help him uh, address that. The discovery of the uh, drawing at the College of Arms, uh, for me, uh, I was, I've spent my career working with uh, antique imperial jewels, um, made it somehow inevitable that we should make or seek to make a replacement, um, as, of course, the original was stolen in 1951. Uh, so last year, we commissioned uh, a goldsmith called Philip Denyer in Soho, uh, who was very familiar with working with such jewels and, and has worked with Ottoman jewels as well, uh, to recreate it as closely as we possibly could. And of course, you can see it over there. Um, using rose diamonds recovered from damaged or distressed 18th century jewels uh, with an 18th century clockwork movement to rotate the central star, uh, enamel heads, all of which are on tremblant, sprung to move, uh, as are the sprigs. Uh, and so in wear, one imagines that uh, Nelson would enter a room uh, wearing this object uh, with the star rotating and everything <laughs> trembling uh, in a dynamic way, uh, no doubt including Emma Hamilton trembling. Uh, <laughs> And we know she wore this object uh, at, at times as well. Following Nelson's death at the Battle of Trafalgar, uh, the jewel was uh, inherited by his brother, uh, the Reverend William Nelson, who became, undeservably, uh, the first Earl Nelson and also received £100,000 from the British government in 1805 by way of thanks. Um, he, however, had no um, connection to this object. Nelson himself had viewed it as, this, as another order of chivalry and wore it as such on his uniform. But for William Nelson, he viewed it no further than just a simple item of jewelry. Uh, and he allowed his daughter, Charlotte, uh, to change it. So Charlotte, and wear it as just an object of jewelry. So she stripped away all the, if you like, all the best bits of it, uh, which are the wonderful Ottoman flower heads, the, the clockwork movement, uh, took away all the exoticism of this object and made it into an object that she could wear pinned on her gown uh, as a bodice ornament uh, in a rather stiff and truncated manner. And of course, it was in this form that it descended down uh, for another 150 odd years until it was eventually stolen from Greenwich. So in fact, I was at Greenwich yesterday for a meeting and that makes them feel a lot better because they, <laughs> knowing that, the, that they didn't really even have this sort of proper one, you know. Um, <laughs> And here we can show how the jewel works. This is filmed at the Goldsmiths uh, Hall. Uh, we use a key to wind the clockwork movement, but Nelson, we know, uh, <laughs> arranged for people to wind it for him. Of course, he only had one arm, so he found it very difficult. Uh, <laughs> so it's the most bizarre an extraordinary object, and here's the reverse of it. Uh, and you can see the clockwork movement. And when we made it, we made it on a turban pin. Uh, so uh, it was very much as the Sultan would have dispatched it. Uh, the jewel itself was uh, unveiled in Nelson's cabin in HMS Victory down at Portsmouth last October on Trafalgar Day, the 21st of October. Uh, and so it's been a wonderful voyage uh, an exploration of Ottoman British cultural history, shared history, uh, and indeed, to my amazement, just three or four weeks ago, I was summoned to show this object to the recently re-elected President Erdogan uh, of Turkey, uh, who is the nearest you can get. In fact, he's probably beyond the powers of a, Tur of a sultan now, uh, who, was, who was fascinated to see it, um, because it really is one of the earliest uh, connections between our cultures. Um, and uh, so on this lovely final image, I think we all deserve our lunch. Thank you very much.